Um, how do you understand the philosophy of mind? Can you locate it for us in this broad scope of philosophy? You know, is it, is it a subset of metaphysics? Is it its own discipline alongside? Is it an intersection between epistemology and metaphysics? What, what do we do with it? Where, where is it? Yeah, that's a great question, Parker. Um, well, it, it actually uh, began, I would say, as a subset of metaphysics, but mm. uh, it branched off and uh, for some time now, I'm going to say for 70 years mm -hmm. at least, it's been its own area of philosophy. So uh, you can, there are courses in philosophy of mind. You can get a PhD in that sub area. Yeah. Uh, and so, but but to do it properly, uh, you need epistemology and metaphysics mm -hmm. uh, because those are treasure troves of resource uh, to to have in place when you approach this field. Yeah. So, so that that that's basically it's its own it got its own vocabulary now and so on, but it does borrow from yeah. these other. Uh, historical fields. Okay. And as, as it's become its own discipline, um, do you think, has that helped or, or has it hindered uh, the study of, of the philosophy of mind? I can, I can imagine uh, it being hindered because it's, it's on its own little section and you don't have to worry as much about the epistemology or metaphysics, but maybe I'm, I'm just guessing there. No, you're actually quite right about that. Um, I mean, the good news is that it is uh, allowed to, uh, uh, philosophers and theologians to focus their attention mm -hmm. on a narrower range of issues. And that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. But the price that you pay for that <clears throat> is, as you pointed out, uh, you don't bring to it uh, the, the proper background categories that will help you yeah. uh, think for yourself. So the, 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 the cash value of your observation is that philosophy of mind has sadly been dominated uh, by those who are kind of committed to scientism. Yeah. And, and to be, uh, you may not believe this, but uh, it, it, it was increasingly the case that PhDs in philosophy were not getting trained in broad metaphysics. And wow. so they would, they, they, I can tell you, like Paul Churchland and uh, others, mm -hmm. uh, who are well known in the field, and they're atheists and materialists. Uh, their 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 writings are really weak, uh, mm -hmm. and they're they're pretty. I mean, my grad students read some of it and say, "This is, are you kidding me?" <laughs> and, you know, and I say, "No, this is MIT Press. <laughs> this isn't some Chigger Creek Bible College Press down in Arkansas." You know? Yeah. Or whatever, right? So uh, you're right. It's 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 good news and bad news, but I think it's ultimately bad news. Yeah. Well, it, is that a is that a hangover? The the, the right. them not being grounded in metaphysics uh, is that a hangover from like logical positivism, and they they thought that they don't need to, or was that a uniquely scientism? Is is there a connection between those two that is well, cut yeah. off? Yes, um, it was a hangover from logical positivism, but logical positivism uh, pretty much went the way of the dodo, right. uh, but it was replaced with scientism. Okay. And uh, so uh, you're, as a result, um, a science was given uh, virtually by so many philosophers uh, the task and the authority of defining reality and the mm -hmm. philosopher's job was merely to analyze the concepts that yeah. were used in scientific theory or ethics. We, we don't make claims about what re reality, hmm. we make claims about our talk about reality or right. our thinking about reality. Well, I'd rather be a bartender, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. than, than if that's all I'm doing. So, right. so yeah, that's what happened, but there's been a revival of metaphysics now going on for probably 30 years. Yeah. Thank God for it. And Seriously. now it's a robust field of its own and things are getting better. Yeah, that's that's really good to hear. So as we jump into uh, your argument uh, for God from consciousness, uh, can we define, can you help us define consciousness so we have a better idea what we're talking about? Yeah, there are, there are uh, three ways to define it and then uh, a fourth <laughs> that... <laughs> And uh, so, so one way, some people try to define consciousness as 
any state, con- uh, some state C is a state of consciousness, mm-hmm. just in case it has intentionality or ofness. So it's about something. Yeah. So the claim, and I think this is right, that no physical or brain state is about anything. Yeah. Uh, but but conscious states are of. Uh, I'm thinking of London, or my sensation is about the lamp, or of the lamp. Uh, the problem with that definition is that there are some conscious states that don't appear to have intentionality, like an itch. Uh, mm. Itches don't seem to be about anything, but it is a, it is a, 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 something caused it, but that's yep. different than it being about. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I would say that uh, intentionality is a sufficient condition, but not necessary. Okay. Another way um, is to define it in terms of being a state to which the subject has, uh, in, uh, has private access so that I can have a third person uh, descriptive knowledge of everything physical because anything physical is a public object. It's yep. publicly accessible to all of us, including my brain states. But my conscious states are accessible to me alone in the, in the basic way and others know about my conscious states in a derivative way. Namely, I report, I report them to them or I give off body language mm-hmm. and they infer I'm in pain or something of that sort. I think the best definition of consciousness, uh, uh, if you're going to try to define it, is mm-hmm. that some con- state C is a state of consciousness just in case there is a what it is like to be in C – now, yeah. um, I believe that every conscious state has its own what's called phenomenological texture. Uh, there's a what it's like to be in pain. There's a what it's like to be thinking about London. And that's different than the what it's like to be thinking about a vacation in Hawaii. Now, if there were no detectable differences yeah. between those two thoughts, Parker, then I would not be able to mm-hmm. tell the difference or know what I was thinking about by simple introspection. So I can tell you yeah. what the difference is between those two thoughts or in which one I'm thinking about by simply paying attention to the thoughts themselves. Thus, there has to be something uh, that, that, that is uh, uh, detectable. And they call that the, what it's like to pain, and that differs from what it's like to tasting a, a strawberry or tasting a lemon or smelling a rose mm-hmm. or having a desire for ice cream or whatever it might be. Uh, the fourth definition yeah. is is actually telling because it's what the dualist would predict. And that's that t- at the end of the day, consciousness is actually defined ostensibly by just simply pointing to an example of it. So if a person has been anesthetized mm-hmm. in an operation and they're starting to wake up and they feel a throb and they sense they're thirsty and they can he- hear noises, they feel a desire for a drink and they're thinking, I, don't, I believe I'm still at home, but I'm not sure. Where am I? Uh, what's happening is they're regaining consciousness. What is consciousness? It states like that. Hmm. So ostensive definition is when you define something by pointing to examples of it. Now, why is that important? Well, we use, often were able to define one thing in terms of something else, like a bachelor can be defined as an unmarried male. Mm-hmm. An electron can be defined as uh, an object, or, uh, a particle wave that has a certain rest mass and a certain charge. Now, um, matter is typically capable of being defined in terms of other things, like any state of the brain can be defined in terms of such and such neurons that have calcium ions and so on. Mm-hmm. You, but, but. Eventually, you don't want to, and you've got to stop the infinite regress or the circle, and you have to learn, you have to define your basic terms by simply pointing to them in the world. Mm -hmm. And you can't define, there's nothing more basic in terms of which you could define them. And so, my view is that conscious states, the dualists would predict that my conscious states would be just basic to me. I mean, if I were born blind, I, you could not define what it's like to see red to me. Yeah. I, just would, I would have no notion of what you were talking about. Yeah. So, so it's, it's consciousness 
is defined ostensibly, but brain states aren't, so conscious states can't be brain states. Mm. Yeah. So that's yeah. just a quick answer to the, the four definitions. And Yeah, it's, that's really helpful. So uh, so for the, the listeners there, um, the the first definition about uh, intentionality, something that's about uh, aboutness, uh, is sufficient, but it's not necessary because, as Dr. Moreland said, you have uh, itches, which don't seem to be about things. Maybe you could argue it's about your skin and this location feeling an itch, but, you know, uh, philosophers can eat your lunch on that. Um, so uh, the itch can be uh, a necessary condition even for the itch is the aboutness principle, that that third one that there are, sorry, uh, what it's likeness. Yes. So there's something that it's like to oh, experience yeah. an itch. And, and I have private access to it. Yeah. You actually don't know for sure what it's like for me to feel an itch. Right. right. Uh, you can reason that we're an awful lot alike. And mm -hmm. uh, by analogy, you can. And so you're likely to know, but but I have a way of knowing it. You don't. Right. I, I'm aware of it. <laughs> so yeah. you're absolutely right. I, yeah. I agree with you 100%.